You have questions, we have answers. This is Jane Muller. And this is Ken Muller. Welcome to our show, all about real estate with Ken and Jane. Today, we're joined again with Adam Neary. Adam wears many hats, and last week we had Adam discuss with us his role with the New Jersey, um, um, with the East Brunswick Playhouse 22. Uh, this week, we're going to put on another hat. We're going to talk about your role as director uh, with the Depart- New Jersey Department of Human Resources. Adam, welcome back to our show. Thank you. It's actually human services. Oh, I'm sorry. I said resources. Yeah, yes, human yes, resources, resources yeah, right. I've got to get my eyes. Muscle memory there. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Human services. Oh, my apologies. Right. Um, so you are you oversee various boards and commissions, and looking at your, prof- your uh, resume, it's quite an important role. So we're going to kind of, this show is not really going to be so much about real estate, but it's it's important around the holiday season to talk about some of the, the um, important and vital programs that that the state provides for people that are really in need of, of uh, counseling and, and services. Yeah, um, it is yeah. in a way associated with uh, real estate because um, why real estate is to do with people, right? The people yeah. is largely uh, affected by the, the policies and the programs, right? And so that's why it's very important for our audience to aware of certain program or opportunities for them to apply. Right. And I'll second yeah. that too, because we're, we're in New Jersey. So this is another reason why New Jersey is a great place to live. Last week, we spoke about the Playhouse 22, which is in the heart of East Brunswick and how important um, culture, theater, and the arts are to any community and a big factor why people choose to live in a particular area. So likewise, the state has a lot of resources and the New Jersey Department of Human Services has has a very important role in uh, overseeing a lot of the, the, the boards and the uh, programs that go on. And we're going to talk with Adam about his uh, role as a director in that um, department. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what Department of Human Services is. Um, It is the largest of the state agencies. We serve about one out of four residents some way, somehow. If you think Medicaid, you think programs for individuals with developmental disabilities, you think programs for aging, uh, mental health and uh, and addiction services, SNAP, which is food stamps, uh, Mm -hmm. child uh, care facilities, they all come under the umbrella of the Department of Human Services. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have a footprint, obviously, that's very large. And we talk about the holiday season, the need is even greater. And there's always the, the stress that comes along with it. I mean, there's a, just a natural stress that comes along with the holiday season. And our department has a very large footprint for mental health needs. And that's something that we're really pushing heavily in the last year or so. Coming out of the pandemic is that mental health is equal to physical health. Oh, yeah. yeah and uh, we, yeah. we are uh, the front agency uh, on a national level. I mean, every mm-hmm. 50, every state is required to have a 988 hotline, which mm. is the new hotline mm-hmm. for those with who are in mental health needs. And we have uh, we are the department that's responsible for uh, setting that up and operating it. So that's just one small component of everything that DHS does. Right. So let's talk in, in some detail about some of the, the those programs that you touched upon, starting with mental health. Mental health, like I agree, I think that's it's often overlooked or it's often it used to be like the this hidden illness that people that had it did not want to come to the forefront and you know there's so many different things in mental health depression i mean uh, you know just suicide um just a whole array of things and it's it's finally coming to the forefront of how important it, it is and how many people in the population it affects in one form or another so what type of uh, programs do you guys have uh, to, to service that well, I mean, namely just uh, 988 being the uh, okay. largest one. What is 988? 988 is the National uh, Suicide Hotline. Okay. And that's also there to help people with the mental health, uh, if they're going through a mental health uh, crisis. Crisis. And it's not just for individuals to call, but it's also for loved ones and family members to call, too. If they see that they're having a family, because we all have yeah. episodes where our mental health is waning. Mm-hmm. Just like if you get a cold or you stub a toe, toe. That, those are all physical conditions. I'm not right. equating a stubbed toe with a suicide uh, threat, but I'm just saying we need to treat, we need to lift that stigma that has mm-hmm. been mental health right. care for years. And I think over the last few years, especially with the pandemic, we're realizing that it's a really important need. You need to check your mental health. You need to go see help mm-hmm. when when it's when you need it. And that's part of what we do at the department is just uh, pushing out that message, connecting services. We over, we our division of mental health and addiction services. The key point is addiction services. You have a lot of people who mm-hmm. will 
use um, narcotics. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, that's uh, where we have a large footprint on taking care of people with uh, in opiate recovery and uh, opiate remediation. All those who are actually uh, currently addicted, we 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 did the pivot from saying all drugs were bad to say, okay, you're going to be in a, if you're going to be taking uh, drugs or you're going to be uh, addicted to drugs, we're going to here to help you. And that's a lot of what we're doing uh, in harm reduction type activities. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Just oh. just continue to talk about the um, mental health, right? When it used to be, I thought, I thought that time, mental health is like either you have a medical condition or you don't. And later on in your own life, I realized this may not be true. Made me at a certain time of your someone's life, at that period, you may have a mental issue. And I have to share something. I mean, when the COVID started, the school uh, shut down, right? Our daughter is like a very happy uh, child, you know, like the girl next door, right? Very kind, very easygoing. But at one point, she was like totally, I couldn't recognize her. It's like I'm looking at a body without a soul. It's a frightening me. She was like a zombie. I, I look at her, I just thought, it can't be, you know, it, it's just something wrong, terribly wrong. So immediately I uh, contact the school counselor. And uh, she had amazing school counselor. Immediately, she got involved and uh, helping and uh, set up the, the meeting with her and everything. I think after two mm -hmm. weeks, three weeks, and um, the, the, the cheeky girl came back. <laughs> she started to joke. She started to mm -hmm. make a very dry sense of okay. humor. She started to, I mean, you know, like gradually now the first day, but you can see that little happiness came back that was like very amazing so this kind of uh, mental issue is not if you think you, you never had a problem you never know right you, you have to watch your loved ones yep. maybe at that point something just happened if you get involved early so like we did right the school mm -hmm. helped greatly so the counselor is fantastic and helped her out of it you know, that was really, I mean, that's the, that, that's the, the one time I'm so close encounter with a mental issue. And I'm happy you guys went that yeah. route instead yeah. of thinking, oh, this is, must be just something or mm -hmm. no. You or gotta, you're just in a funk and then you just disregard it. Yeah. But right, you have to, the parents, you have to be involved and you have to be attuned to what, you know, mm -hmm. the changes in, in your children's uh, behavior. And each um, other's uh, lives too. Yeah. yeah. I was so, fr yeah. I mean, I, I was, I just, I just felt that wasn't wasn't my daughter like somebody somehow her soul get took out of her her body so i was really frightened so the first thing i sent my husband that let's contact the school contact the school you know is everything okay you know i i didn't expect the school had so much help i just want to let school know if something her grade or study not there because she needed help i wasn't gonna get uh, uh actually a doctor involved but the school took it over so quickly everything was like a turn around so quickly so we never have to uh, really seek medical help otherwise I, we would go that route yeah. but i just want to notify the school i just want to see right whether she had a problem in the classroom but no, the school took it over from there. Everything was was really good. Yeah. And I think COVID yeah. was a very challenging period for for many kids, you know, in, in, as well as adults, because of the isolation factor. Even if you're with your own family, people still were um, were feeling the longing to socialize. So you can imagine all the people that live alone that had no form of social interaction, the elderly, yeah. the poor people. So that it was you know mm -hmm. doubly taxing on them. Um, and then with with the mental health, I think a lot of the a lot of the children develop it. It could be things as 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 significant as uh, peer pressure, you know, getting them into you know doing what their friends and their peers are doing, getting into drug habits because the mental health they're not they don't they feel the need to be wanted or liked, so they're gonna they're gonna do whatever the group is doing, and that's you know go down that path. So if you can so building confidence, and that all goes back to the self esteem and the acting, getting join, <laughs> yeah. be, become a part of Playhouse Twenty Two. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I saw recently just yeah. there's a lot of efforts now to take so uh, take cell phones out of high school students' hands mm -hmm. during yeah. school because of the, the connectness with social media. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, I am not a big social media person. Mm -hmm. I barely have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. and I still have to update my MySpace account. I mean, just improving yeah. how. But I think it's interesting when you look at these studies how hyper connected 
we all are now mm-hmm. and how yes. hyper-connected high school students are. And that's leading to a lot more bullying, mm-hmm. a lot more uh, real-time interactions that we grew, we didn't grow up with. Yes. And I right. think it's, it's – and I think that's going to what the need for mental health. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I, I, we're having this conversation also lifting that stigma yeah. that mm-hmm. it's all yeah. right to ask for help. Right. And having parents having the right to turn to their to mm-hmm. their schools or to their loved ones saying, I'm having a problem here. Yes. I mean, as I said, you get a cold, you, you get a, go to the doctor. Yeah. You're feeling depressed. You kind of say, OK, I'm just going to sleep it off. Yeah. But it, I'm just going to more plow. than just that. I mean, there's a yes. chemical side of things, which I honestly do not have even the background to understand. Mm-hmm. But you got to get that help. Right. Absolutely. And social media can be great. It can promote a lot of positivity, but it can also be used for negative things. Like yeah. there was a case at Rutgers about a student a few years ago where they, there was a negative post about what supposedly he did and it just it caused him to kill himself. So exactly. that's where the things, you know, that's where, like you were saying, it can be used destructively and can really cause a lot of damage. Yep. And yes. so getting involved in intervening at an early stage is, is really key. Yeah. For the smart men. commuter, uh, smart uh, uh, computer habits, social media yeah. habits, how you handle that. I'm not a I'm not a trained physician. I can't speak to it. But as a person, I know limiting yourself from your phone is always a good thing. I I, I told my daughter when you go to bed. I mean, she had a cell phone when she was uh, fourth grade because we have to find her and whatnot. But she's not allowed to have a phone in her bedroom. I don't have mine. No, your bedroom is for you to sleep. Definitely not not for to have a phone, right? So that 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 is the uh, you know the thing. But um, yeah. As a parent, we're not, I'm not suggesting you have to, uh, you know, control your children, but be interested in their life and watching them and help them to grow. Set up good examples, too. I mean, I mean, our dinner table, we don't just on the phone and everything. You know, you have a conversation. So that's really, uh, you know, that that's, yeah. And it is amazing important. how people are so, how so many youth are linked to the cell phone, whether it be they're out in the public. They're, I've been to Manhattan a few times and you see people are looking down at their phones rather than interacting and, and appreciating all the, the, the people, all the beauty around them. They're, they're so glued to this phone. Go to the gym. People are looking at their phones, listening <laughs> yeah. to their music. So everybody, it's, it's isolating in some ways. I mean, it's great. It has a lot of great things to it, but but it does have the negative um, aspect to it, too. All right, why don't we take a short break? We'll be right back after these messages. Okay, welcome back to our show. We're joined with Adam Neary, who's the um, director of the New Jersey Department of Human Services. So, Adam, we were talking about mental health, and now we're going to just switch a little bit, uh, which is definitely related to uh, mental health, and that is the uh, Opioid Recovery and Remediation Council. And let's uh, talk about that program that the state has. Yep. Well, uh, the state, all New Jersey and all 50 states entered into agreement with opiate uh, manufacturing distributors as part of a whole bunch of uh, lawsuits that are um, dealing with the opiate crisis. And New Jersey is slated to receive $1.1 billion over the next 18 years to put money out in the street to help people in recovery and those to curb opiate abuse. And uh, we in New Jersey, my Department of Human Services, has been tasked with getting that money out into the street. Um, Earlier this year, uh, the governor signed a piece of legislation that created the Opiate uh, Recovery and Remediation Council, which is a 10 public member board Mm -hmm. from different stakeholder groups, academics, people in recovery themselves, Mm -hmm. uh, to review different options and make recommendations on how to spend that money. And again, Mm -hmm. we have 18 years to spend that money. It's $1.1 billion, which does sound like a lot of money for a few of us who do not make $1.1 billion (laughs) a year. That's right. I I make about half of that. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But in reality, it's not much money, so we have to maximize on those resources. So for the past uh, eight months or so, the council has been uh, reviewing uh, input from the community. Mm-hmm. We had five public listening sessions, mm-hmm. uh, just hearing from the community how they want that money. And now they've been ranking close north of 50 different proposals that came from state agencies, from public input, from their own personal backgrounds, and how to um, roll out the first tranche of money. And that's where we are right now is reviewing all those different options, all those different plans, and how we can maximize on those dollars. I'm yeah. always, you know, uh, 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 shocked in a way. I thought opium was from last century because that's what happened to China because the mm-hmm. that time the British mm-hmm. used uh, opium um, to basically destroy the China. Yeah, but- that, that time. So any 
Any people from China when we hear opium, just like we we, we see a no, devil. Jane, this is different. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is this is opioid, which I believe again. I'm not same a drug. Concept, I'm not a the drug. Same same chemical. Chemical. Oh, oh, it is the same. Chemical. Oh, I didn't. You see, that's it something is. I know. I, it is. Just, I thought it was opioid was the things they extracting from like um, different over the counter products. It is. Um, it's all that same. Oh, that's the same chemical background. that's in that's in yeah, marijuana. You're in, yeah. Oh, okay. no, that's no, not. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, opium. from the same, um, same, yeah, poppy. Oh, it is so from the same uh, okay. material. I mean, yeah. just yeah. different yeah. way of uh, 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 using it. Using it or extracting yeah, it. Yeah, they used to just yeah. smoke it. You know? I see. Yeah, and then um. that. Now I'm getting into the world of being a uh, chemist, chemist, which I am not sure <laughs> of. Right. Barely passed chemistry in high school, <laughs> but it's the same components in uh, the yeah. opium. Yeah, that's that is now. Synthetically or, or organically grown in opiate prescriptions. When you take uh, a painkiller, yeah, it's the same concept because it's. And what's happened is, there. I mean, uh, the evolution of painkillers have gone so much where people were being prescribed opiates for various painkillers, and they became addicted to it. Right. And wow. once they started pulling back on those, when doctors and physicians started pulling back on those painkillers because mm-hmm. of the fact they're being people addicted, mm-hmm. it was easier to get heroin on the street. Oh, which had the same, I guess, chemical same, effect once again, or, or chemical craving effect. it or it satisfied yeah, their craving. But so it, you have created uh, many people that have, without their real knowledge, have become addicted to opiates. Mm. So you, you have to... But, uh, weed people yeah. off, which is not just a turning it off type of switch. No pun intended, to, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's you go into when somebody is addicted, you need to deal with that addiction and a lot of that harm reduction type of stuff. I mean, you hear uh, naloxone, which is Narcan, uh, which is uh, the reme- – which is used to – uh, deal with an overdose. When somebody mm. has an overdose, you give them uh, naloxone, which is the chem- uh, which is a chemical name for Narcan, which right. is the what well, you know on the streets, mm. and that will revive them from an overdose. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is put uh, as much as much naloxone out on the streets, in pharmacies, in libraries, mm. in police stations. I mean, police uh, carry uh, naloxone with them because there are people that are overdosing. You yeah. give them a naloxone spray, which revives them, so you can take them and sort of essentially save their lives mm. with a naloxone spray. And that's something that we started with uh, providing free naloxone to any entity out there. And we're, we expanded originally, started with pharmacists, then it went to police stations and EMTs, and now it's growing out to be in the community. community uh, yeah. Schools. Have wow. that, which is, and I mean, is, yeah. it's you're looking. Mean, there's a two-edged sword there. Like you're giving people something to recover their overdose, but what are you doing? At the, right. The next step is then you have to deal with the over, uh, the actual addiction. Process. Right. So that's why you guys, that ten-person um, uh, task force, is has a very has a lot of uh, thought has to go into how that money is going to be allocated because you want to you obviously want prevention you want to you want to help people that are already mm-hmm. overdosing you need to you know that need to be phased off it you need all different so you have to decide how that how much to allocate towards prevention how much to community outreach how much to allocate towards <laughs> actual resources like Norcan to st- stock it so that people that are in that already you know addicts can can have help and, and also looking it's, at job opportunities People mm-hmm. often lose their jobs when they have an addiction yes. mm. because they can't get they can't come to work because mm-hmm. uh, they just don't can't. So you need to help them with their addiction, mm-hmm. get them weaned off, and also provide job opportunities for mm-hmm. them. And or having employers willing to hire people that are currently going through recovery. This mm-hmm. and we're talking about yeah. stigma for mental and health. Stig- right, there's and a big stig- stigma like stem- if. Yeah. yeah, if somebody said they're a heroin user or a former one or or an yeah. opioid addict, I think that there's a big there's a negative stigma. But it, yeah. but they could be they're all different walks of life. Probably there could be you know the, there's no one one user profile, right? Yeah. I'm sure there's people all different professions, all different walks of life that are addicts. Yeah. You know, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't just strike the you know the it, it has no um, poverty or it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor. No. It, it's it, the addiction covers every demographic, it, every yeah. background. 
every community. You can't mm-hmm. put your head in the sand and think like a town that we live in East Brunswick. Oh, there's no, uh, there's nobody uh, that's in recovery. This, that's an absolute lie. Yeah. yeah. There are there's... people that are every day waking up trying to put their lives together yes. with an addiction. Mm. And as you said, the stigma. We need to lift that stigma and embrace mm-hmm. and try to provide them the help. And that's what we do with the Department of Human Services. We help humans. Yeah. And, and have them encourage. And yeah. it's not put our head in the sand and be afraid about talking about addictions. Let's embrace addictions. Let's, it's not a law enforcement issue. It's a social issue. And it's a health issue. When, you're in, when you have an addiction, you, you need to treat that as a health condition. I mean, I know people that smoke cigarettes. That's an addiction to, ter- sure. uh, to nicotine. Mm-hmm. Yes. Alcoholism is addiction. an addiction. They're... So we treat them differently. So let's treat them equally they... as something to help people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, the uh, for the public, we also, I mean, need compassion towards the people because, uh, I mean, they could happen to our loved one, could happen to ourselves. Yeah. We just have to be uh, really uh, supporting and do what we can and, uh, you know, to help, to have a compassion. Yes. And we have a good team place in East Brunswick. Um, we have uh, Jen Stetson, you know, Jen from the township. She's, the, she's on the county council because mm-hmm. getting back to the, the money that the state is receiving, mm-hmm. 261 what we call subdivisions, which is all 21 counties and a, a number of municipalities, mm. are also receiving money as part of the settlement. Mm-hmm. So there's we're doing what we're doing on a state level. Mm-hmm. All 21 counties is on these 260, 220-something oh. uh, municipalities right. are doing their own thing. And we can't, because of a settlement agreement, we can't really communicate with each other. Okay. But a lot of the counties are starting to use their resources, too. Mm. So you can look... At the state from the larger picture, but here in Middlesex County and in East Brunswick, there are efforts to help the community as well. Mm-hmm. It's, I think even the community wide uh, wise, right? I used to be on the board for uh, Meridian uh, Hospital, right? Uh, I think at the one stage uh, I try, I introduced the, the um, them to our high school to see whether there are any education programs and the hospital can help to educate the ju- the uh, students and help them to prevention and overcome. You know, that's a two part. One's prevention, one's That's what uh, I was going to ask you know, Adam overcome. too. If the state has yeah. any programs to re- go, go into the high schools and the middle schools, and you know, to have give public service messages to the students there to try to, I mean, to try to advise them the dangers, and you know, have have addicts or that are in recovery to talk about it, and you know, to discourage, try to discourage them from going down that path. There are probably programs, but I don't know them offhand. Yeah. I'll probably allow them through the Department of Education. Yeah. But, I mean, this is a good use for the subdivisions to mm-hmm. put money, put, uh, put uh, go to the schools. Yes. Yeah. Especially mm-hmm. high school students yes. so they understand, yeah. especially if you're a high school track player mm-hmm. or you're a dance yeah. uh, performer in one of the uh, high school production. Mm-hmm. If you do something to your knee, they'll yeah. prescribe mm-hmm. you something. Mm-hmm. That's an opiate. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, so and you have the high school students – are not sheltered from opiates well, because yeah. they get injured. They need to get some kind of – they get a painkiller. And they have to understand what that means. And also yeah. knowing the the uh, the power that some of these prescription mm. drugs have, mm. it's a lot of uh, black market stuff. Mm-hmm. One high school student um, saying, hey, this is this gets you a little high here. Try this. And next thing you know, mm-hmm. they're having them spread around parties. Let's – teach high school students that this stuff is dangerous. Very yeah, dangerous. should not use this yeah. as candy. This is, yeah. I mean, that when we went to high school, there was definitely people drinking at parties. There was right. no such thing as, now it's, now it's evolved, evolved into... More s- really serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. Once again, as the parents, you really have to, uh, you know, involved in the children's life and, uh, you know, to make sure, especially sometimes the parents on vacation, when they come back, the party's going on. Yeah, the parents are not around. So, yeah. It's uh, giving them the tools to make smart decisions. Yeah. And I guess they have, I guess the medical profession has to prescribe these opioid based um, products. There's nothing they can, they can't get it. There's, I guess, I don't, I don't know enough about the medical me, science me to know me if neither. there's any alternative, but apparently not. Because that's a big problem, not only in, in the school, but also, also adults and, at, uh, you know, professional athletes. You know, yeah. probably know the story about Brett Farr. He almost the famous Green Bay Packer quarterback who was a you know all time great. He he was heavily addicted. I guess probably playing football had a lot of injuries. Yeah. But they said he was addicted very badly and you know almost cost him his life. So yeah. Yeah. so it's quite a quite a problem. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, Adam. Thank you so much. We didn't get to cover everything else that you guys do, but um, these were very important topics. And thank you again for being our special guest. It was our pleasure to have you. My pleasure.
We'll see everyone next week. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you.